Hello, future filmmakers, and welcome to my Illustrator tutorial. Now, you may be wondering what a channel that wants to be, you know, geared towards filmmaking is doing making an Illustrator tutorial. And that's fairly easy to explain. See, a lot of times you may get a job and the client needs to send you their logo to put it in the end or put on the video somewhere and they send you a logo that's only 250 pixels by 250 pixels. Now, if you're making a HD video, you know, 1080p uh, video, it's still gonna be too small for that if you wanna blow it up to any size that takes up any appreciable screen real estate. So, a lot of times, you know, I'll find myself having to import that into Illustrator and either copying it or tracing it or just remaking it in some form or fashion so that I can use it in the video and give them a, a quality product that isn't diminished by this low quality like JPEG that they sent. Uh, another reason is because some clients will require specific graphics to be made from scratch uh, for the project that they want done. I find that a lot of times clients will just reach out to a, a video production house or a videographer, cinematographer not really realizing that there's a difference between what we do and what a graphics designer does. But if you have the ability to do basic things in Illustrator, you might be able to accomplish what they want and be able to provide that service to them and you can either then upcharge them or just include it in your package. Especially starting out where you might not you know, be able to afford to subcontract to a graphics design or anything like that. And the last reason you might need to use Illustrator is because you might need to make an interesting thumbnail for your video, and one of the best places to do that is inside of Illustrator. Now, before we get started, I want you to check the description of the video below. I have a download link for a folder that contains a bunch of project files that we will be using. Uh, let me bring this on over here. So you can see I have a bunch of files here, and that's so that we're all working with relatively the same thing throughout the course of this video. So let me move this over here. So why don't you go ahead, download it, and then open up the oneintroduction.ai uh, Adobe Illustrator file. All right, so now let's all make sure we're all looking at roughly the same layout in, a er, yeah, in After Effects. Now let's make sure we're all looking at roughly the same layout of Illustrator. So let me just get it to the very basic layout and then we'll go from there. So what I need you to do is go to Window, workspace select essentials and if essentials is already selected and your workspace doesn't look like this I want you to then go down to reset essentials once you've done that once you go to toolbars and select advanced that'll open up the toolbar a little bit give us a little bit more uh, options to choose from and once you have that done let's go over some of the things that we see here so here's your libraries uh, Maybe in another tutorial, I'll go over adding colors and stuff to this. But as you go on, you may find that you work with specific clients more often. Maybe you have a permanent job as a cinematographer or video content producer for a company. You have brand specific colors that you're working with. As you can see here, the one company I work, work with a lot, they have brand specific colors that I need to work, work with very often. So I've got them saved under my libraries here. Next, you have your layers panel. Much like Photoshop, you have layers and you can put different things on different layers. But in, in Illustrator, most of the time we're working with just a single layer. Uh, as you can see here, everything's on one layer. But if you do need to work with multiple layers, just go down here, create new layer, and it creates a new layer. If you have something on a specific layer that you need moved to another layer, you can see when you select it, when you have something selected, notice that there's nothing here now, but once you select something, see I selected the background, a little square pops up here. You can then click and drag that to the layer you want it on. See how now the background that I once had is now on layer two. Uh, I'm gonna undo that. Move the uh, rectangle up there. and then I will move it back. Nope, that didn't take, there we go. So if you have a layer that you'd want to hide, 
that you don't want to see anymore, you just click this little eyeball here, turn that off. If you want to see it again, click it and bring it back. If you have a layer that you want to lock, like say maybe you're tracing something, which we'll get into later, you click here and it locks the layer. Now you can no longer manipulate anything on that layer. And finally, we have the properties panel. Now, a, a lot of older versions of Illustrator don't have this. And so if you don't have a properties panel, that's probably what you're working with, but you're, you're working with an older properties panel or an older version of Illustrator. The properties panel is like a one-stop shop almost. Before you used to have to click around and open specific windows within Illustrator to do your work. So if you were working with text, you would have to open up a character panel. Or if you were working with shapes, you had to open up a specific transform or appearance panel so that you could change the colors and stuff on it. But the properties panel brings up the most appropriate options for your workspace. So as you can see here, uh, I've got my text selected. So it's got the character panel, paragraph, and area type all up here so that I can just quickly access it. If you have nothing selected, it brings up your documents, some documents options. So I could change the uh, unit of measurement we're working with. Uh, if I had multiple artboards, I could select a different artboard. I could bring up a ruler, add a grid, uh, or show the transparency layers so that if I got rid of that background, you're now working with a transparent layer and this shows you that. Most of the time when I'm working, I have the ruler up. You can opt to have that up or not throughout this uh, tutorial. It kind of helps when lining things up because if you go up here and you can drag down a line. And so if you want everything within two inches or if you want something, the bottom of something within on that two inch line from the top of your workspace, you could drag a line down and now you know where two in, the two inch mark is. And it, this will even snap to that mark for you, making it a little easier. And then to get rid of it, you just drag it away. And then we have our guides here. Uh, so our snap guides, click to hide our smart guides. Our smart guides are those, those that pink line that pops up here. And then down here, we have some preferences. This is the one major one we're gonna focus on throughout this tutorial. Go ahead and click it. Click on your rectangle and then go over to stroke and give it a black stroke and maybe up it to 10. So now you have this black stroke. Now say you wanted to resize this rectangle. So you click and resize it down and the stroke resizes appropriately with that rectangle. So let's undo that. Control Z. Now unselect it and then unselect that option. Now resize your rectangle again. You'll see that the stroke stays the same no matter what size I have this. So, so I normally just have that selected. And then finally we have our documents set up down here. So we could change some different aspects of our document and preferences. Now, if you need to zoom in to specific aspects of your project file, just go over here to the little magnifier or press Z on your keyboard, the Z key. Click that and you get a little magnifier with a plus. Clicking it zooms in to where you're clicking. If you hold the Alt key while you have that tool selected, it becomes a little minus magnifier and it zooms out. Alternatively, press the V key and, or go up here and select your selection tool. You could hit control minus or control plus on your keyboard. Now when you do that, it'll zoom into the center of whatever object you have selected. So if I have this star selected and I zoom in, it'll zoom into the center of the star. And this and that. If you wanna zoom out and so that the artboard takes up the whole screen, just hit control zero and it centers it and brings this so it takes up the whole screen. Now the way I zoom in and out, and I think most people in Illustrator do, is by holding down the Alt key and just scrolling the scroll wheel on your mouse. And that'll zoom you in and out wherever the mouse is. And then I press Control-Zero to re-center my frame. 
Now say you're zoomed in over here and you were working in something here. You're manipulating something that you need to be zoomed in over here. And you just need to move over a little bit. You can either select the hand tool down here or pr and press H to bring up your hand tool and then click and drag to move over. Or select your selection tool again. Press down the space bar, brings up your hand tool, and as long as you're holding that space bar, that hand tool is active. Release the space bar and you go back to whatever tool you were working with. Same thing happens if you're using, say, this tool and you need to bring up your selection tool. Press and hold the control key and it brings up your selection tool. So if I've got, I'm working with this, making a shape, and I'm like, ugh, I need to move it. Press and hold the control and move that around. Okay. Now I'm going to go over two, two tools in this part of this tutorial, and that's the selection tool and the direct selection tool. The selection tool selects an object as a whole. So I've got this rectangle with the selection tool. I can take the rectangle and move it around. Same with the star down here or the text, just select it and I move it around. Now, if I want to manipulate a specific aspect of one of these shapes, I'll need the direct selection tool. So I click this. And then I click an anchor point that I want to select and then click and drag. And it drags around that specific anchor point. And then I've got, uh, had some weird artifact in there. Never really saw that before, so I don't know what that is. But yeah, so the direct selection tool enables you to manipulate anchor points individually. So go ahead and play around with that for a minute. Pause these videos anytime you need to. Now, as you're working, you may notice that when you hover over a tool, the name of the tool pops up. So you see direct selection tool there and selection tool there, along with the keyboard shortcut. It's V for the selection tool and A for the direct selection tool. Also, you may notice that some of these tools have little carrots or triangles in the corner. And that just means under that specific button is a list of tools. So if you click and hold here, you'll see you have the rectangle tool, the ellipse tool, polygon tool, star tool, and flare tool. And then if you want to select the rectangle tool, you just release while you're over the rectangle tool. Now you can make rectangles. All right, and that should cover it for everything we need to do about the basics of the layout and some of the tools in Illustrator. Come back next time and we'll get started importing assets and setting up so that we can start drawing inside of Illustrator. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe and click that bell so that you stay up to date to all my latest videos. Thanks for watching, bye. Hello and welcome back to episode two of my Illustrator basics tutorial. In this episode, we're gonna cover Get setting up your project file, how to save your document, and how to import images. So let's get started. So up here you have a, a bunch of presets already laid out, but we're gonna go to more presets. So we're gonna use A4. Now over here on this side, you can select your measurement that you're gonna be using. Pixels, picas, picas, inches, feet, feet and inches, yards, and so on and so forth. We're just going to work with inches and really the size doesn't particularly matter for our projects here. Down here, you can choose portrait or landscape. If you wanted to, you could input your own custom dimensions here. Select the number of artboards you are going to be working with. We're only going to be working with one. Down here, you have your color mode, RGB or CMYK color. I work mostly in RGB because I'm at work mostly with screens and monitors. Uh, most of my artwork and stuff gets input into videos, so, or as thumbnails, which are then viewed on a screen, phone screen or a computer monitor, or even a television set. RGB refers to the primary colors of light, red, green, and blue that are used in monitors and television screens. CMYK refers to the primary colors of cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, which are used in printing as often called full color printing. The combination of all RGB colors evenly produces a white color, whereas the combination of all CMYK inks evenly produces black. And that's why you'll get a little more vibrancy out of your RGB. See here you can see the same color values, but one is RGB, one is CMYK, and this is a little more saturated, a little more vibrant than their CMYK counterpart. So go ahead and click Create. 
and it should create a nice blank template. Now let's go ahead and save the document. So file, save as, save it in my Illustrator tutorial. So we're going to create a new folder inside that folder that you downloaded and we're going to name it class files one or we'll just name the folder class files go in there and we'll name this class files one and save then it'll bring up this i see no reason to change any of this press ok and you can see it's saving inside the class files folder Now we're going to go over importing into this and setting that up. So you go to file, go down to place. We'll go into our Illustrator tutorial folder. I want you to select this getting started PNG and then hit template. Cause we want it to be a template in the background and hit place. You can see it's placed onto our artboard and it, you can see it's grayed out slightly instead of being that full black which it actually is if you look at the actual picture you can see it's a black instead of a gray but it's grayed out and that tells us that this is something that can be traced it's in the background and we'll have you have that on your layers separate it created a separate layer template and that's just so we can trace over it a lot of artists will actually sketch out and then sketch out in like a notepad or something by hand and then import it and trace it this way they find it a little easier uh, for me, as you can see, I'm a horrible drawer by hand. <laughs> this is supposed to be a moon. I don't know what it is. This is supposed to be like an ostrich. It's, it's a whole thing, but it's going to work for what purposes we have. Now over here, you can see the layer is already locked. You can unlock it and select it and move it around. But we're going to go ahead and leave it locked. And that's all we're, we've got for today. It's just a short little how to get set up today. The next lesson is going to be a bit longer, so I didn't want to have this all in one bit and have it one long video. Thanks for watching. Uh, subscribe and ring that bell so you don't miss any of our future videos. And we'll see you next time. Hello and welcome to episode two of my Illustrator Basics tutorial. Today we're going to draw this scene using the shape tools. Okay, go ahead and open up that class files one Illustrator file that we worked on last time. And that's what we'll be working with today. Okay, let's get started. Make sure you have layer one selected, not the template layer since that's locked and we don't want to be messing with it. Now go over here and just select the rectangle tool. If the rectangle tool isn't up like mine isn't, go ahead and click and hold it and then hover over rectangle tool and release. So if we go ahead and draw a rectangle, you see I have a basic rectangle here. And then we hold the alt key now we're drawing from the center from where we clicked. See that? We're going to draw out from the center from where we clicked. Normally, you draw out from that corner where you clicked. Now let's start drawing a rectangle and we want to draw a square. So now you just press and hold the shift key and it draws a perfect square. You can use both the shift and alt key together. So alt shift and it draws a perfect square out from the center. So let's draw a perfect square, go over to our properties panel, and we can see here's where we adjust the fill. We can make it red, blue, whatever we want, but we don't want any fill at the moment. And then here is where we can adjust the stroke, change the stroke color or the stroke thickness. I wanna leave mine at two for this. Select our rectangle tool, and we're just going to take this and draw a rectangle here. Oh, now for as we go forward, let's just make sure we have a black stroke, no fill and a two or three point stroke thickness. Oh, and before I forget, let's make sure that we pop down to this scale strokes and effects and make sure that's unchecked. That way, when we draw our, our shapes and we resize them, it doesn't change the size of the stroke. So make sure your rectangle tool is selected. And we're just gonna click and draw from here. That'll make our base of the house. We'll click and draw for a window. Now we want that window to be the same on this side. So I'm gonna press V to go to my selection tool, hold down Alt and click and drag this over. 
and you can see our snap guide is making sure that it's the same height as the previous one and now with it we have that there i want this top one to also be the same as the bottom one so click and drag alt bring that up here bring up my rectangle tool again and i'm just going to make a slightly smaller one there press v hold alt bring it over here like so now i think that's kind of boring so i want to round the edges on, on these ones so i'm going to hold alt and just zoom in a little bit and you can see that there's these little circles on the inside corners if i click and drag those little circles it begins rounding the edges a little bit so i'm going to just round them you know what i'm just going to make completely rounded edges on each side press spacebar so i bring up the hand tool move over click this one and notice how if i click in the center here it does nothing that's because there's nothing in the center my only path is up here there was a fill here so let's go ahead and give that a uh, red fill and deselect it by clicking away. Now, if there was a fill there and I clicked in the center, it would select it. But since there's no fill, that means there's no shape there for it. So I'm going to go ahead and select this and bring the corners in. Now for this one, I don't want rounded corners on both sides. So I'm going to select the shape, clicking to select it. And then clicking and dragging it brings just that one corner point in and rounds it. But what if I wanted this corner to mirror this one? Well, I'm going to press undo. And now I'm going to press, oh, press and hold shift, click this corner, and then click this corner. And now click and drag. And you can see it rounds that nicely. And there. I think that's good. And control zero to go back out. Take that rectangle tool one last time and make the door just like that. Now I need the circle tool. I need the circle tool to make the body of the emu, the head, and this window up here. So we'll go over to the rectangle tool, click and hold, and go down to the ellipse tool. Now I'm going to hold the ellipse tool in the center of where I think this is. And I'm going to press and hold alt and it's going to draw out from the center. And then I'm also going to press and hold shift. That'll make sure it's a perfect circle. I think that's good. I'm going to go over here and select my selection tool, press V on the keyboard. I'm just going to move it so it's in line with the window and the door here. Go back to my ellipse tool and I'm going to click here in this corner and just draw out a nice large oval. Now it's okay that it's not matched up. I'm going to go ahead and move it with my selection tool and move it into place. And I actually want it to just move back a little bit. So I'm going to use my arrow keys just to move it forward just a little and back just a hair. That's good. Now for the head, I want another perfect circles. So I'm just going to hold the shift key and like that. Okay, now we need the triangle for the roof and his little wing. So I'm gonna press and hold this and go down to the polygon tool. Now the polygon tool, when you bring it out, it's normally gonna make a hexagon like this. So how do we get it to make a triangle? Well, you can just click and select the number of points. So I'm gonna press three there and there's our triangle go to my selection tool and I'm just going to click this corner and hold shift and alt and just scale it up like so and move it over into place and want to move it to the right a little bit there we go I think it's a little high so I'm going to go over here to my direct selection tool or press a and I want to select just that one anchor point at the top and I want to just flatten it down just a little bit. I also want to move in, just go ahead and round that one corner. So it's just a rounded corner there. And I want to round this corner just a little bit like so. Same with this one. 
there we go. Now normally when you make a triangle, you make draw it out and you have the selection tool and you pull this in. You can't select individual corners with the selection tool like you can in the in a rectangle. So this will just modify all of the corners the same way it wants. So you have basically a circle. So let's go back, make our triangle. Now if I hold the shift key while I do this, it'll make hold the triangle perfectly up and down. Or so let's make this the size we want. And I think like that. Now I want to take the selection tool and I really want a thinner triangle. So I'm just gonna mouse over here till I get the left and right arrows and then just push that in so it's a little thinner. And then I'll go over here so that I can rotate it. See that the little angular left and right arrows there. Oh, I accidentally moved it. It's a little hard sometimes. Click. I'm going to hold the shift key so that I can move it on 40 to 45 degree increments. I think this increment will look great or this angle will look great down here. So I'm going to release it, move it down and just make it a little bit shorter. And there we go. There's our little emu wing. Oh, almost forgot the moon up here. So let's go back to the ellipse tool. Let's go in here and hold shift and alt and just scale that up so we have a moon. And then we're going to make a bunch of irregular circles here in the center. Just like that. And that'll make more sense later. And we'll just put a little circle down here on the doorknob. Okay, back to the emu. Now I want to make this leg and I also want to do the, the f crossed panes up here. So we're going to go over here and select the line segment tool. And let's go ahead and zoom in on this window. And we'll go up here to this anchor point and click and drag down and hold shift. That way it'll maintain a perfectly up and down line segment. Drag it down and release. over here and release now we have a perfect little cross there for that let's go ahead and zoom in down here press and hold space so I can move over and we will get the line segment tool bring that down just like that I want to want to make the emu's leg a little bit thicker so we'll do a four point now you can see here it's a little rounded which I'm going to keep but it Say you wanted something different. You can do a flat end, a butt end cap, which is just a flat edge, the rounded end cap, or this projecting end cap, which if you look at the difference between that and the round, the butt end cap, it's just projected beyond where you drew it there. And you could do the same with corners, which if we draw a perfect a rectangle here and go to stroke, you can round the corners just a little bit. That way you're, you don't have to mess with these. It just rounds the corner while leaving the inside a sharp. Or you could do a bevel. And we'll delete that by pressing, oops, selecting it, and pressing delete. Okay, now let's draw the these feathers back here and maybe some grass up here. So we'll go to the arc tool by going to the lines, line segment tool, pressing and holding, hovering over the arc tool, and then release. And now, see that's a bit thick, so let's go ahead and take that down to two again. Just like that, we got the feathers. And then we'll click here for the neck. Let's do this to make the neck as well. Just like that. And now let's zoom in on the head and do some work on this bird's head. So let's go ahead and give it some little feathers here. I want to maybe a, a one thickness stroke. Let's go ahead and bring back up the polygon tool. Shrink that down. Rotate it, hold shift to rotate in 45 degree increments. I want to make this thinner, so we're just gonna 
go ahead and do that. And selection tool, press V and move it down here. Like so. Go to the ellipse tool and we'll make an eye. Just like that. And go ahead and make the feet polygon tool. Make another vertical triangle. So I want this to be flat and I want I want the foot to come down at an angle like that. So how am I gonna do that? Well let's just shrink this down real quick to the size we want. And I think that would be a good size there. So we'll move it and line it up with where we want it. Go to the direct selection tool or press A. And then select just this point. And I can move it over until it makes kind of a right triangle. I'm going to select this point and just round it, round the foot just a little bit. And go back to the selection tool, copy, control C, paste, control V. And just whip it around there. So, okay, there we have the foot done. Now it's time for the stars. The stars is similar. The star tool is very similar to the polygon tool where you can click and change the number of sides. It defaults to five. So we'll just go to put that star in there. One big star. And it's a little easier just to draw it out and draw some stars instead of copying and pasting these and resizing them. To be various sizes. So we'll just draw some stars. And then we will end by just drawing the foreground elements here. So select your rectangle tool and just draw that over. Okay, that should be it for this time. It might not look like much. Go ahead and uh, hide your template tool by going to your layers and then clicking toggle visibility. And see, it doesn't look too bad. We'll get into it so that uh, you can't see the horizon on this house. But uh, I think those stars look great. Everything else is kind of meh. But we're just copying a simple drawing. So just learning how to use the shape tool. All right, that's it we have for this time. Please go ahead and subscribe and ring that bell so you don't miss any future videos. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys again next time. Oh, and before you go, remember to save this because we'll be working with this next time by pressing control S or going up to file, save. Thanks for watching, see you guys next time. Hello and welcome to episode four of this Illustrator Basics tutorial. Today we're gonna go over coloring, our, coloring in our figures and how to group objects. So let's start with these stars. Let's select this first star right here. We'll go to the fill and here we can see we have our swatches. Now yours might not look the exact same as mine because I have a fill down here from when I did the practice run for this episode four. So I want these stars to be yellow. So I'm going to select one of these yellows here. None of them are really to my liking. So what I can do is go into the color mixer or palette here. And you can see I have the RGB colors here. So I can mess with these to fine tune this yellow to how I like it. Or I can go up to this little hamburger menu and go down to HSB, which stands for Hue, Saturation, and Brightness. Now that'll enable me to make it darker, change the hue, which changes the color of it, or I could even lighten it up. So let's go with something like that. Looks like a good lightness. And then we're gonna go ahead and turn that stroke off. Perfect. Now we can go in, select the star, Go to the fill and you can see it saves right here the last color we we're working on so we can click that and then go to stroke get rid of that stroke again now we could do that for each individual star or we could select the star press i for the eyedropper tool and just click on the star we already did now press v to go back to the selection tool and as you see it not only copied the color but it also got rid of the stroke now we could do that individually for each star or we could select them all by clicking and dragging or holding shift and clicking each one individually. Hitting that eyedropper tool again, 
clicking on there. Now let's go back, press V to go back to the select tool. And you can see it changed the color, the fill color, and the stroke of all those stars. Now let's say we want to manipulate all of these stars together from now on. We don't want them to be separate. So we can click and drag and highlight them all, or hold shift and individually click each one. And you can go up to Object, Group, or press Control G. And now that groups all the, these stars together. So if you just select one, it selects them all, and you can move them around like that. Now you may group items together and eventually decide, oh, I want to move this specific star, but I don't want to move everything else. So what you can do is select them again and go up to Object, Ungroup, or Shift Control G, deselect them by clicking somewhere else, then selecting that one star, and just moving it around. All right, now let's go ahead and color in our moon. So let's select that. We're going to use the same fill that we use for the stars, but we're gonna go ahead and lighten it up by desaturating it just a hair, maybe a little bit more. I just want a hint of yellow for the moon. And then we'll get rid of the moon's stroke. Now I'm gonna hold shift and collect, click all these little circles. Get rid of their stroke. Use the same fill we did for the moon, but I'm gonna darken it up. Uh, so I'm just gonna use the brightness and go ahead and darken it to about there. So let's see how that looks. Now that's a little too dark. So I'm gonna select them all again. And I don't wanna have to do that anymore. So I'm gonna hit Control G that groups them together. So now I can just manipulate them all the same time or just click and select them all at the same time so let's go ahead and lighten that up just a hair there we go now there's our moon with the craters the dark marks in them so let's move down to this house select the house uh, roof uh, we're gonna make that black Uh oh now we can't see the circle that was in there so how do we find it I, I can move around it doesn't seem to be selecting it because the roof is on top of it. So what we can do is press Control Y or go up to View and go to Outline. And this goes back to the outline. It outlines all the objects. And we can go ahead and select that window, go to Arrange, and click Bring to Front. Press Control Y again to go back to the regular view. Let's give it a dark blue a little bit darker than that for it, for the fill. Get rid of that stroke. Actually, let's make the stroke the same color as our window pane, which we're going to go with a dark brown. Okay, now the, the inside panes are hidden. So let's do control Y again, select this one. Go to Arrange, Bring to Front, select this one, Arrange, Bring to Front. And then press Control y You can see we have our window here. Let's go ahead down to this house. We're going to make this house a dark purple. So somewhere around there. Darken it up because it is nighttime. We don't want it to be too dark. And we're going to go ahead and select each window by holding Shift going over and selecting it so there we go had a problem selecting that one press the eyedropper tool I go up here and click this window well oh, I must have had the background selected uh, D select that by clicking the background again got that eyedropper tool going up here selecting that and it copies the aspects of this window Press V to go back to the selection tool. And now let's do the door. We're gonna make the door a brown. Let's use that as a starting color. And again, it's dark out, so we're gonna darken it up a little bit. And give this a black fill. Let's go ahead and do the background here. Take the fill. I want it to be a dark green. And we'll darken it up because it is nighttime. There we go. 
Now, if yours is in front, like it, like it probably is, just go to arrange, send it back. And I know it probably is because that was the last thing we drew on our last class. So let's go ahead and draw or fill in our emu. Emu. Go ahead and select that. We're going to just use some basic grays, medium gray for the body. Oh, I'm selecting strokes. Again, medium gray for the head. No stroke. No stroke. Now, what was that that happened there? Well, I went into an isolation mode because I accidentally double clicked the emu's body. So what does that do? Well, now I can only affect the body. I can't select the, this and move it around or anything like that. So how do we get out of here? Well, just press back up there or escape. Okay, going back to what I was doing was removing the stroke. For the wing, we'll make that a slightly darker gray with no stroke. There we go. There's the emu. Now let's go ahead and draw another big rectangle. We're going to go ahead and send that to the back. And let's go for the color. I'm going to go with like a dark, dark purple, even darker than that. Maybe like a dark blue, something like that. There we go. There's our nighttime scene. Now, the last thing I want to cover before we save this and go on to our next lesson, press V. So let's say we have the moon selected and we really like that color. Well, you can go into your fill color, go over to the, the swatches panel, and you can go down here and just add it as a new swatch. And then over here, it pops up. You can give it a swatch name. You could even maybe change it a little bit if you want to fine tune it. And just press OK. And then it pops up down here as a new swatch. Now that swatch is only in this Illustrator file. Go to File, New. Uh, we'll just do a new A4. And I'll make a quick thing. Notice how those custom swatches aren't here. It's only in this Illustrator file over here. If you want to carry over colors to different programs select, or different files, if you end up using them a lot, you can go to Libraries. It should load in any day now. And go down here to Add Element and add fill color. And once you do that, it'll add that fill color in here. But I don't want that, so delete it. Additionally, if you were constantly using the same graphics, like you can see here, I've got my company logos here. You could take that graphic and just drag it in there and it'll pop that up here as your artwork. Now, obviously, I don't want just a pale yellow circle, so I'm gonna go ahead and delete that. All right, that's all I have for today. So go just go ahead up to file, save or control S, save your work. If you enjoyed this tutorial, go ahead and subscribe and ring that bell so you don't miss any future videos. And I will see you guys next time. Thanks for watching. Hello everyone and welcome back to this Illustrator Basics tutorial. Today we will be going over the Shape Builder tool. Make sure you have open your five shapebuildertool.ai file and then your five shape builder tool 2.ai file. You'll notice that those two are pretty much the exact same. Well, they are the exact same. We're just going to be using each one for a different purpose today. And then make sure you also opened up your class files 1.ai, the one that we've been working on. So what is the shape builder tool? Well, it's right here. You might not see it. It might be one of these other uh, options for the tools that you might have. But uh, if you see either one of those, just click and hover over to the Shape Builder Tool and Release or press Shift M to select it. Now the Shape Builder Tool takes different shapes and adds them together. So I'm gonna hold down Control. And I'm just gonna move this down to here while holding down Control, select them both. Now it's highlighting different parts of the circle and the triangle. 
Now, if I go ahead and click and drag over both of them, it combines them all together and it kind of changed the fill on me. So I'm gonna go ahead and reselect that and add that back in, which I'll get into in a little bit on how to use this to color things. Now you see it combined them together. So if I deselect it by holding control and clicking it off and then going back over and selecting it, I can move that around as if it were just one object because now it is just one object. Now the pathing is around this. So I'm gonna press control Z until I've unjoined them, so to speak. Now it can also subtract parts of an object away. So if I hold down Alt, it brings up a little minus sign there next to the Shape Builder tool point. And I click here, it subtracts that part from both of these shapes. So if I press V to bring up the selection tool, I can, and click away and deselect them, I can now move this part of the triangle and this part of the circle separately. So let's go ahead and make a Pac-Man using the uh, deletion part of the Shape Builder tool. Change the color of that triangle to something that we can see before we start moving. A nice teal color would look good. And we'll move it to there. So we'll press Shift M to change to our Shape Builder tool. Press and hold Control to, and to select all of these. And now you can hold Alt to delete that part away. And then go ahead and hold it to delete that as well. And now you have a basic Pac-Man shape. So let's make one of Pac-Man's nemesis, a ghost. Press V to bring up the selection tool. I'm gonna move that over just a little bit. And I'm gonna move this triangle just in line there. Press A to bring up the direct selection tool. Click this part of the triangle once, and then drag, click and drag it down to make, round that out a little bit. Press V to bring up the selection tool again. Hold Alt, and drag that over and release and hold alt again and drag that over and release. So you see now we've kind of created the bottom of the ghost there. Now we need to make the top rounded a little bit. So I'm just gonna click this corner here, hold shift and click this corner here. And now just drag and round those tops in. So now we have Pac-Man's nemesis, a ghost, but we need to join it together. So let's click and drag to select the elements of the ghost and then press shift M to bring up the selection tool. And then we will just click and drag through all the parts that we want to join together. Make sure you get those little parts there where they overlap. So let's zoom in down there so we can see better. You can see that th those aren't selected there. So if I wanted to, I could press Alt and cut those parts out, but I don't want to do that. So I'm gonna go ahead and just drag through that to make sure I capture those parts. So press Control zero, go back out. Now we have our ghost and our Pac-Man. Now you can pause that and mess around with the Shape Builder tool. And once you're ready, unpause the video and we're heading on over to five Shape Builder tool two. Let's take the selection tool and let's make this a different color just so we're working with, so we can see what we're working with. And let's go ahead and make a couple copies of that. And we're going to go ahead and make them a different color. You can make each one a different color. It's up to you. So I'm going to take this triangle, move it here, and I'm actually going to enlarge it a little bit. And then I'm going to move a couple of these triangles inside like that. So I'm going to work with this one first. So click and drag to select it. Bring up the Shape Builder tool. And I'm just gonna pick a random color and then come over here and work with this. As you can see, it selects different parts of this triangle and circle. So I could change this, just that part to brown. Press V to bring up the selection tool, deselect it all, and I'm gonna move that triangle away. And you can see I colored this part of the circle brown. I can actually move that around, essentially cut it off from the circle and change the fill color. So let's move that back, bring up our selection tool. Uh, let's bring a different color into this. How about a gray for this one? Oh, didn't select it all. So holding down control to bring up the selection tool, capturing it all. And now I can make that gray and this one blue like that. So let's go ahead and do that with this, the square and triangles. I'm gonna press control to bring up the selection, press and hold control to bring up the selection tool. 
deselect that by clicking off here in the background and then clicking and dragging to select. I'm going to then release it, which brings back up our shape builder tool. And I'm just going to color just this part and then pick a different color, change the color of the whole thing, which didn't change the color of this since it's been cut off from the different triangle. We'll change the tip of this triangle to green. As you can see, the Shape Builder tool does provide a lot of different utility here. So go ahead and play around with that for a little bit. You can pause the video here if you want to. Uh, once you're ready, unpause the video and we'll go over to Class File 1. So I want to make this moon a crescent shape. How am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to press V to bring up the Selection tool. Hold down Alt and click and drag away so that I make a copy of the moon. I'm going to then make the, this have no fill and a green stroke. And I'm going to increase the stroke just a little bit. Move this back over to par partially cover the moon. And then I'm going to select it all by holding down shift and clicking the moon background and one of the moon craters that we grouped together before. Now I'm gonna press Shift M to bring up our selection tool and then press and hold Alt. And it's going to cut away that portion. Then I can cut away the different portions of the craters here. Put that away. Let's go ahead and zoom in by holding Alt and scrolling. I um, help if I press and hold Alt to cut those away. And sometimes you need to go over things a few times. And sometimes you forget to hold Alt like I just did. So press Control-0 to back out. And you see we press V to go to your selection tool. And you can see we made a crescent moon. Now let's change the scene to daytime. So I'm going to click and drag and select all of that. And then hold Shift, select these stars that I missed. Press Control-G to group them together. Range, send to back. I'm gonna go to my layers panel here, add a new layer, move layer three below layer one. I'm gonna select that background that we grouped together, grab the dot here, pull it down so it's on layer three. I'm gonna turn it off. I'm gonna go back up to layer one, select the rectangle tool, make a new rectangle the properties tool now let's give it a nice light blue and i want something a, maybe a little lighter than that right about there that's good we're going to send that to the back like so then we'll select the ellipse tool make a sun big old sun like that make that yellow go over to your line segment tool and we're just going to make a line there, give it a black stroke. I'm going to make the stroke just a little thicker so we can see it. Press V to bring up your selection tool, select that black stroke, hold Alt, drag it over so that it, you can drag like that. Press Control Zero so we're recentered. So now that I've got these lines drawn here, Let's go ahead and select this background because I'm going to need that to be a lighter color. And the same with the house. We're going to need that to be a lighter color. And the windows, just so we can sell this effect that it's during the day and this is casting a shadow. So the windows will make those a lighter color. And finally, the door. And I think the emu comes off light enough. So let's go ahead and select everything. Press this Shape Builder tool, and we're going to go ahead and just select a darker green down here, and just color that. And then press V to go back to our Selection tool, and you can see it does change the color, and it kind of looks like it's casting a shadow. But we have these overhanging strokes down here from the Line Segment tool, and also strokes going around, but we don't want that. So let's go ahead, pull back up, select these again. 
go back to the shape builder tool, hold down alt, and that'll delete those. Press V to go back to the selection tool, and we'll start removing the stroke. From these objects. Now you can see we have a more seamless shadow being cast. here. Now there is something to note when you've got to be careful when using the selection tool to color things. So let's go ahead and select this all again and then bring up the selection tool and let's just change the color of right there. So I'm just going to change it to a random color, purple. We'll change that color and go back to the selection tool by either pressing V or going up and clicking it. And now let's deselect everything and just select this. You can see it took that neck of our emu with it. So you just have to be careful when coloring things that you're not drastically changing the shape of some of the things that you've built. Well, that's all we have today. I'll go ahead and, if you follow me along, go ahead and press Control Z to undo that. Make sure you save your file by pressing Control S or going up to File Save. If you enjoyed this tutorial, make sure you subscribe and ring that bell so you don't miss any future videos. And thanks for watching. Welcome back everyone to this Illustrator Basics tutorial. Today we're not going to go over any new tools, though we will learn a few new techniques. But we're just going to use the tools that we've already learned to make a logo. And the logo today will be this cool 90s S, the Stussy. It was a very popular one when I was in high school. Yeah, I know, I'm old. But let's get started. Let's go to File New or Control N, A4, and make sure we're still in Landscape and hit Create. All right. So let's go ahead and grab our rectangle tool. We'll make that first little bit like so. And then get a triangle tool or get the polygon tool, make a triangle. Move it up there, go to V for your selection tool. And we'll ma make it up here to a little hat. Scroll up, grab this corner and hold shift so that we scale it up proportionally it locks on that corner like so but now we've run out of area up here and if we flip it and move it down we're probably gonna run off down there we, so we can't really move this down and it appears I made a mistake setting this in landscape instead of portrait so how can I fix that without losing all the work we've done nothing selected and you can do that by clicking off in the background we're going to select deselect and we're gonna go over here to edit artboard here you can see we can change the dimensions or change the preset but we just want to flip it to portrait now let's press Control zero so we can zoom out and center cool. and now to exit this we go over here to exit or just come over here and select a tool and automatically exits so we'll select this and we're just gonna raise it up to the top Select it all again. Make sure your fill is turned off. So we don't, we don't want any fill. We just want to work with a stroke. I'm going to actually make the stroke just a point bigger so we can see what we're working with. And now let's go to Object, Transform, Reflect. And you can see it just flipped it upside down. It reflected the image vertically, or well, in this case, it says horizontal. And you can see here with the diagrams next to it, it shows you the way that it flips. So with horizontal, it flips it upside down. With vertical, it flips it left and right. And then you could set your own custom angles if you so choose. Now, if we would hit OK, it would just flip that and it would be done. But we want a copy of it. So you want to make sure you click copy. You can see there it copied it. So just before you click off, go ahead and just drag that down to about there now go ahead click and drag and select everything we're going to recenter this on the page like so uh, let's go ahead and just i want to make this just a tiny bit wider so how about right there oh we'll recenter it perfect okay now get your line segment tool you're gonna go down here until it snaps on you can see where it says anchor we're going to click and that's going to attach that line segment tool to that anchor point and hold shift as you go up. So we draw through this anchor point here. Now you could try and 
stop it on that anchor point but I find that sometimes it doesn't actually snap it to the anchor point and you get better results if you just draw through the area you want to stop at and release and we'll use the shape builder tool later to cut that off so we're going to go to, to this anchor point hold shift so we go off at a 45 degree angle and we'll do the same thing at this anchor point and with these two anchor points Now we have all the things that we need in place for our Stussy. We just need to clean it up and color it. Go get your selection tool, press V, click and drag and capture everything. Then get your shape builder tool. And now let's just combine parts of this together. And we've got the core of our Stussy. You zoom in you see that you have these little areas here so make sure you get those too these tiny little triangles looks like about it so control zero now hold down alt and clean up these outside line segments now let's color this Stussy. So go over here to fill and select whatever color you want for the main big color. I'm gonna go with green. And then you just click in here and it colors it green. Now you can go over here and select a second or third color if you wanna make these two different colors. I'm going with yellow. We'll just make those yellow. And now let's go ahead to our selection tool. Make sure everything's highlighted. We're gonna get rid of the stroke around it. And there you go. We've made that classic 90s era Stussy S. I guess it was around before the 90s, but that's when it was really popular in my lifetime. Well, that's all we have today for this episode. If you like this tutorial, click that like button, subscribe, and ring that bell so you don't miss any future episodes. I hope to see you guys next time. Thanks for watching. Welcome back, guys, to this Illustrator Basics tutorial. Today, we will be going over the curvature tool. Uh, the curvature tool is a fairly new tool. I think it came out in like 2016 or 2017. And it's really made drawing so much easier. Before you had to use the pen tool and it was kind of a pain to make rounded angles or rounded corners comparatively to using the pen tool. So it's just really made Illustrator so much easier. So let's get started. Let's go to file down to place or shift control P. And we're going to select the 7 curvature tool.jpg. Go to template, make sure that's checked, and click place. Okay, so we got our grayed out template. Let's go ahead and either hit shift tilde or go over to the curvature tool right here. And we're going to start with this mask. So let's just hold down alt and scroll in. Hit the space bar to bring up our hand, hold it. Let's just move and center this so we can see everything. Now I like to start putting that first anchor point in a nice curve. So we're going to start on this side in this big curve here. Now I'm going to place my next anchor point at the peak of the curve, which would be right here. And place the following one here, 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 and here. Let's go over here and let's turn off that fill. You can see it kind of snapped it into place uh, pretty well. It gave us the outline of our mask. So we can move these anchor points by just clicking and, and dragging and kind of moving them around and it adjusts the shape based on where we're moving those individual anchor points. We could add anchor points along the way by clicking here. So if I needed this to just move out just a little bit or something. I can add an anchor point. We can remove anchor points by pressing, cl by clicking and pressing delete. Now, when you're placing these anchor points, really less is more. You get a much better, cleaner curve when you have fewer anchor points. And I'll show you that right here. Let me just zoom out, press V, and I'm just going to take this up here and hold, set that there for a minute. And I'm just going to zoom in and I'm going to place several 
anchor points along this whole thing. You can see it's, it's doing a fairly good job. You can see it did a fairly good job of making that mask, but it's real lumpy compared to this one up here. Now we could fix that by let's turn off this mask underneath and it really shows you how lumpy it is. And we can fix that by going back to our curvature tool, clicking on an anchor point and deleting the ones that are too many. and adjusting the positions of some of these other ones. See how that's making this a lot better. And it's really cleaned up this end. Let's go ahead and move this down here. I see the difference between this side and this side over here. I'm just gonna go ahead and delete this and bring this back down into place. Let's zoom in on the eye. Bring our curvature tool back by pressing shift tilde. I'm going to click here and we're going to make the eye of our mask. There we go. We got a nice oval, but that's not quite what we have on our template. Our template has more of a pointed corner on the sides. So how do we do that? Well, let's delete this and I'll show you. So we're going to click once at the top of this curve here. We're going to double click here. Then we'll click once here, double click here, and then click once here. On our double click spot, it made a corner pin and it told it that we're not going to make a curve here. We'll curve the line between this one and the next anchor point, but we're not gonna curve the line through this anchor point. That's called a corner pin. Now, what if you make a corner pin by accident and it's halfway through your drawing and you just noticed it? Are you going to have to delete everything and start over or delete that pin and add a new one? No, you can change your, your anchor points by double clicking them. So that changes them back to regular anchor points and you double click them and it changes it back to corner pins. So go ahead and make the other eye over here. You can see I only single clicked everything so I can go back here and change these to corner pins. So press control zero, we'll go back out and let's zoom in on this camera. Hold the space bar so we can bring up our hand and adjust it. All right, now this circle, easy enough, just click four places around and you're gonna get a pretty good circle. Now a better circle would be to use your ellipse tool and hold shift and make your circle and then move it into place, but this gets it done pretty well. So let's go ahead and double click here, double click here, our two corner pins. We'll single click, double click, double click, single click, double click, double click, single click, double click, double click, single click. And now we're just going to single click because if I double click it, this is what happens. It it arcs that uh, line a little bit. So I'm gonna double click it back and turn it back into a corner pin. Now we have this line here. How do we do that? Well, you could switch to your arc tool or you could just click three times and make your nice little arc and hit escape and it stops drawing. So zoom in on this final teardrop and then I'll let you guys do the rest is practice. So I'm gonna double click up here to make your corner pin and then just click halfway at the peak of each of these curves. And then single click to end it because we've already double clicked and made that a corner pin. Then you can go back and adjust these to how you need them to be to make the shape. I press control zero. Now go ahead and make all of these shapes here. Uh, if you need any more practice with these specific shapes, you can always delete what we've done. Well, that's all we have for this episode. If you liked it, please hit that like button, subscribe and ring that bell so that you don't miss any of our future videos. And I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching.
Hello and welcome back to this Illustrator Basics tutorial. Today we're going to be going over the pen tool. Now, I'll be the first to admit, I'm not that great with the pen tool and I don't know if it's a skill I'll ever get really good at. Most of the time when I'm drawing, I like to use the curvature tool and you'll see why when we get into this. I think it's just a little bit easier to manipulate the lines and stuff with the curvature tool. Uh, there are instances where I have used the pen tool on jobs, but most of the time I'm using that curvature tool. So let's create a new document, select the A4 and we'll be landscape, hit create. And now let's import or place our template file that we're going to be tracing. So go to shift place or press shift control P and we're going to select eight pen tool dot JPEG and make sure you select template. So it is a template. All right. So the first one we're going to work with is this crown here and you can zoom in by holding alt and scrolling in. So you select the pen tool by, well, I don't have the pen tool up, but we I'll bring it up. You select the pen tool by clicking on it or pressing P and you place the corner anchor or an anchor by just clicking. So let's just click our way around here. And I have a fill, so make sure you turn that off first. So let's click our way around here to make our nice little crown. And you can make a line with the pen tool like you can with the curvature tool just by pressing escape to end that. So go ahead and press A to bring up your direct selection tool and look at some of these these points. And I'm going to go ahead and turn off the background so we can get a real nice look at our crown. So let's select just this corner here and zoom in a little more. And you can see we have that cornering tool that we get when we make a rectangle with the rectangle tool and that will enable us to round these corners and you can select multiple cornering tools by holding down shift and clicking on this anchor point and it brings up those cornering tools there and we'll just click and round that there a little bit and you can click here hold down shift brings up those cornering tools and we'll just round them down like that pretty simple huh so let's press control zero and move out, open up that or reapply that template background, hold alt and zoom in on this mask, holding space bar, move over. So now we need to make curves here with this pen tool. It's not straight lines like that last one. So I like to place the corners at the peak of a curve. So here, and when you place that, that anchor point, make sure you drag just a little bit for each one you place. We're not going to see any major curves on this one. I just want you to click and drag at the peak of each curve and just drag slightly. Don't worry about getting a perfect mask outline just yet. We're going to come back in and alter all of these anchor points. And you just click once to join that back up. So now press A to bring up your direct selection tool again and go ahead and zoom in on this side just a little bit. Click to bring that up and you see we have the handlebars here. Now the longer a handlebar is, the more influence that anchor point is going to have on that line. So if I stretch that handlebar out, you see it really influences that line and makes a much bigger curve. Same way with this one, really influences and brings it out. Now you can rotate that handlebar those handlebars around the anchor point and that influences the curve and the way that it comes into and out of that anchor point. So if we move this to the left, you see that it, it changes the angle that that line's going to go through that anchor point. So we'll, we'll just manipulate each one of these anchor points. All right, as you can see, we have our mask outline there. Now it's not great. You can see it's pretty lumpy. If we were to use the curvature tool, uh, like we did in the last lesson, you'd see that this would be a lot smoother, but we are able to use the pen tool to do this. So what if I wanna add more anchor points around this? Well, just select this, make sure you have this selected. Press P or select your pen tool again, 
And all you have to do is click, much like the curvature tool, where you want those anchor points to be. Now, what if you want them deleted? Well, you just take your pen tool, hover over it, and click it and it deletes it. But as you see, it also undoes those changes we did to this. So you bring up the direct selection tool again and just pull that out like so. All right, let's do one more shape and then we'll I'll let you guys do the rest yourself. So go ahead and hold Alt, zoom in. We're just gonna do this one shape here. We have the pen tool selected. I'm going to click and drag up here. And I'm just going to click my way around and I'm not going to drag, and you'll see why in a second. So now if I bring up my direct selection tool and zoom in on this point and select it, you'll see all I have is that cornering option. I don't have the handlebars. That's because I didn't click and drag when I was making this anchor point. So am I just gonna have to delete this all and start all over again? Well, no. I can just go over to the pen tool, click and hold, and then come down to this anchor point. And what that does is it allows me to turn a regular anchor point into a curvature anchor point by just clicking and dragging on that anchor point. And then I can manipulate the object like this. Sometimes I find it a little easier to actually make your objects this way than it is to do it the traditional way or the way we did with the mask. Now with the anchor point, when you click and drag out like that, it's going to move both arms of the handlebars in the same direction at the same rate. Notice how they're both going out. So if you want to fine tune this afterwards, you'll have to go back to your direct selection tool and fine tune them individually, each side individually. Now this side is already, if I click, if I bring up my direct selection tool and click it, this side already has the barbells, and that's because when I placed it, I placed it by clicking and dragging. So if I want to make this a regular corner, I bring up that anchor point tool, and I click on it once, and it snaps it back to a regular corner. You can see if I would just click this one again, it would snap it back to a regular corner. Now I have to go back to my direct selection tool, come down here, click this one, and I just want to shorten this one barbell up and not have it affect quite as much, maybe even move this out like so. You can see we made our little half teardrop for the yin and yang tool. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. I want you guys to practice using the pen tool on this cloud and on the camera. And you can even go back to using the curvature tool just to see what the difference, how big of a difference there really is between the two. If you enjoyed this tutorial or found it useful, please hit like and hit that subscribe button and then ring that bell so that you don't miss any of our future videos. And I hope to see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye. Welcome back to this Illustrator Basics tutorial. Today we're going to go over the pencil tool. Now the pencil tool is just the, exactly what it sounds. It's a tool that enables you to draw directly in Illustrator using either the mouse or if you have a, a drawing tablet or anything like, like a Wacom tablet, you can draw using a, a pen in Illustrator. So let's get started. Open up a new document. Uh, I chose the A4 size again. Then go up to File, Place, or hit Shift Control P. Go ahead and select this 9 Katie McBroom Unsplash. Unsplash is a website that has a variety of royalty-free images. You can go there and, and use them in your project. Just make sure you credit the, the owner of the object. So in this case, it was Katie McBroom who made this, took this picture and uploaded it to Unsplash. So thank you, Katie. This is a nice one. So click place and just wait. Stop here. I'm going to go ahead and show you some things. So if I would just click like this, like that, it's going to place the full image in its native resolution with the top left corner exactly where my mouse was. So what I want to do is go back, select that image, and I want to click and drag. And that image is going to be whatever size I drag this out to be. So I want it to fit the top to bottom of this document. So I'm, I, that's what I did. I drug it out to be that. So now we have our image there. We're going to be drawing on top of it and selecting those paths that we draw. So we don't want to actually accidentally 
select the image and move it around. So we want to lock it in place. So we're going to make sure we have the image selected. We're going to go to object, lock, selection, or press control two, and that locks the image. We can no longer grab it or move it around or do anything with this image in particular. If you need to unlock it, you can go back up to object and hit unlock all. To select your pencil tool, you're going to go over here to the shaper tool. Click and hold and go down to the pencil tool or press N. I'm going to change the, the stroke of our pencil tool to a blue, a light blue, so that we can see it on this darker image. I'm going to turn that fill off and I'm just going to draw a couple lines. Now you can see I drew two lines in quick succession and it joined them at the beginning here. Now there are instances where you may want that, but generally speaking, no one wants that. So. Let's open up the pencil tool options by double clicking the pencil tool and going down to keep selected and deselecting that. So I'm going to delete those, select the pencil tool and reopen those options. So here we have a fidelity option with, within the pencil tool. The further it is to the right, the more smooth it is. The, the illustrator will smooth out your drawings with the pencil tool. The further to the left, the more accurate it is to how you move your mouse. So if I select that and I move it like this and draw around, you can see it's kind of bumpy. But if I take and make it smoother and draw that same path, you can see it's a lot smoother. It doesn't have all those lumps in it like the one that has a higher accuracy. I like to just, I don't know why, I really can't tell the difference, but I feel like this is the sweet spot right here. So let's go ahead and delete those. All right, I'm going to zoom in here on the back side of this, this woman's back, I guess, the back side of this photo, select our pencil tool, and I'm just gonna draw a couple lines to signify that like she's moving this way. I'm gonna press V to go back to the selection tool select those and click stroke to bring up some options. Now you have the typical options that you have when dealing with strokes. You could change the, the end cap or the cornering. But down here you have a thing called profile. So you could change the way that this drawing is made. So if you click that, it changes it. So you've got like a skinny line that gets a little fatter and then thins out towards the end. Or you could have one that gets fatter, skinny, fatter. And it just changes the way this line draws. Uh, let's go ahead and pick. I like this one. And you can also change the where it starts. So right now, it starts skinny where I started the line and ends up fatter. But I want it to flip so that it, it kind of peters out as the farther away from her it is. So you do that by clicking this and it flips it. Now something to keep in mind is that it stretches that pattern over the whole line. So if I do just a short line and select it, back out, select it, and I select that again, you can see it just over that short line, it does the whole thing where it goes from thicker to thinner. But if I go ahead and make a very long line like this, go ahead and select that one line change it to the same stroke it changes it does that change over the course of the whole line now that may be something you want to see or it may not be in our case we don't really want that we want to look for that that short transition like this so we'll kind of leave that so let's go ahead and press and hold the spacebar tool so we can move down here to this leg now the picture if you look at the picture it looks like she's hopping and coming down on her hop and going to land on this leg so if I was doing like a cover photo or something for like a magazine or an ad, I might put like arrows signifying she's going down here. So let's go ahead and zoom back in there. Select our pencil tool. I'm just going to draw a line that kind of follows the contour of her, her leg. There. I'm going to select those two lines, go to stroke, Go down here to arrowheads. Now, if I select this one, this will put the arrowhead at the beginning of the line that I drew, which I don't want because she's not going up. She's going down. So I want to put the arrowhead at the bottom. And then I could change the size of the arrowhead, make it smaller or bigger. 
I could change where the arrowhead is in relation to the path I drew. So I could have the arrowhead begin at the end of the path, or I could have it so that the tip of the arrow ends at the end of the path that I drew. So I like that just fine. So arrowheads are pretty straightforward. And let's go just scroll up here to the top, move the drawing over just a little bit. And we're going to just draw a kind of whimsical loop-de-loop -loop here. Go ahead and select it. Go to stroke. And I'm going to go ahead and select dash line. You see, I've got a 10 point in that first field there dash. So I've got a 10 point dash followed by a 10 point space followed by a 10 point dash. Now I can change that. So I have a 10 point dash and a five point space. Or I can have it so it's a 10 point dash, five point space, eight point dash, so on and so forth through the whole thing. So dashes are fairly straightforward with how they're they're done. You can make a pretty custom dash here by just filling this in. So let's deselect that. Let's just go down here. And the final thing I want to show you is how to make a dotted line. So to make a dotted line, bring up your pencil tool and go ahead and draw your line. You see there it's already in the dashed form because that's what I've been doing. But I'm going to go in here and I'm just going to turn this off like I had just drawn this for the first time. So let's turn that off. So what you want to do is once you draw your line, you want to change it to a rounded end cap. And I'm just going to increase the weight so it's easier to see. Change it to a rounded end cap, then go to the dash line, set zero for the first dash, and then select your gap. So I want a 10 point gap. So now we have a dotted line followed by a 10 point gap. Now this also works with the projected end cap, but now it just looks like dotted squares where if you want to dotted lines, you do that. You can even customize the spaces in between here. So you could click here, hit zero for the dash. And then you see it changes it to like a long dash there. And then come into the gap and let's just hit seven. You see now we have a dot, 10 point, dot, seven point space. Well, that's all we have for this tutorial. Uh, on the pencil tool. If you like this tutorial, go ahead and hit that like button, subscribe, and ring that bell so you don't miss any of our future videos. I will see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching. Welcome back to this Illustrator Basics tutorial. Today we're going to be going over brushes, which are kind of an effect that gets applied to strokes or a texture, if you will. So I have some open here. You can open up this brush panel by going to Windows, Brushes, and select the ones you want. You could select under these artistic ones, pick some of these. Really, the only good ones are under artistic and vector. So I've got some open already. So I'll draw a couple shapes and show you how this follows the path that you're working with. So I'm going to draw just a line with the pencil tool and take that curved rectangle tool and draw that out. I'm going to get rid of the fill on that. So I'll select this pencil first and apply a brush stroke to it. You see it applies that texture to the stroke I made. Now I can apply it to anything with a path. So if I'm just working with the stroke around here, I can apply that texture. So let's go ahead, delete these, go to file, place, and we're going to import this one and place our image here. And go to object, lock, selection, or press control two. So we're going to draw a nice little like wing to her, make her like an angel waiting to fight off injuries. So we will just draw a nice wing shape going off of her back like so. Then we'll select all those and we'll try and find a nice stroke that kind of fits this, this look. I, I really like that one, that charcoal tapered. So you can see how brushes will take something that's kind of boring and generic, like a straight line that goes through here and, and changes it. Of course, you can go in and change the profile too, which adds a little something more to it. And switch it like so. Now there are some brush strokes that have a different opacity to them. So if I take my pencil tool, bring this over here, just draw a good enough halo and change it to this. Oh, got to select it first, change it to that. 
you could see this has a opacity to it, so you could see through it. Now we could layer a couple of these and it creates a different, a, a neat effect that you might be looking for. But that is something to keep in mind is that some of these, you may really like them, but some of them have a different opacity, which changes the color on them too. Not just the, not just the ability to look through them. So even if I layer a bunch of these on top of each other, I'm going to need a lot of them before I start to get to that color that I was looking for. I guess just go ahead and delete that and we'll make another line here and we'll select that like that and let's choose one of these ink splotches you can see it follows the line a little bit but it, you're not going to get like ink splotches that go along that line these are meant to be dragged out onto whatever you're working with and if you would take your selection tool and select them and add a fill color, so if you want like a blood splotch or something like that. Well, that just adds a fill color to the whole thing. So what you would have to do is take your direct selection tool and directly select one of those ink splotches and add your color. Or take your selection tool and select it all and go to object, ungroup. And you're going to have to do that a bunch of times because this is just really a bunch of groups within a group. And then you can finally select one of these paths. See, I, I ungrouped them all. So now there's little specks that were in there I was selecting there. So you can select one of those splotches and change just the color of it. Well, that's all we have for today's tutorial. If you found this video helpful, why don't you throw us a like, subscribe, and ring that bell so you don't miss any future videos. I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching. Hello and welcome back to this Illustrator Basics tutorial. Today we're going to be going over colors and how we can manipulate them within Adobe Illustrator. So let's make a couple copies of this. I'm going to hold down Alt, click and drag over. Hold down Alt, click and drag over. We got three copies. As you can see, it's grouped together. So I'm going to highlight them all and go up to Object, Ungroup, or press Shift, Control, G. So now we can select these individually. So as you can see, when we select these different objects, the fill color shows up over here. Under our swatch panel, we can go in and change the different fill color to some pre-selected swatches. Or we can click the color palette or color mixer and bring up the RGB values. You can see this yellow has a 251 R red value, 204 green value, and a zero blue value. It also shows us our hex code. Now, if you're working with a company, they may want you to work with their particular colors, their brand colors. So they may send you RGB values or a hex code that you can use. I prefer a hex code, so if they send you RGB, just go ahead and ask them for that hex code. Additionally, to manipulate these colors a little bit more, we could slide the sliders around to adjust the look of them. So I can make that a little more red, uh, add some magenta or purple to it, and then add some blue back into it and kind of make it like a gray, I guess now, but add a little more blue. And I'm actually adding blue by removing red, which is making it a little bluer. But we can manipulate it more by going over here and selecting the HSB panel, which stands for Hue, Saturation, and Brightness. We can change the hue of our particular color, change the saturation, make it really saturated, which changes that a lot. Or we could change the brightness by making it really bright or really dark. Now let's say we have a color we really like. So I really like this yellow. If I click over here, go back to my swatches, I don't have this color pre-selected. So how do I add it to my swatches so I can just keep jumping to it as I work through this project? Well, go down to this new swatch and just click that. It brings up some options here. You can even name it and then press OK. And it pops the swatch up right here for you to work with. So you can quickly reference that swatch over and over again. However, that color does not show up in other Illustrator files. So if I make a new file, just a new template, open it, make a square. I don't have those swatches I created. They're only in this Illustrator file. If I need those colors, I can add them to my library. 
Now I do that by selecting the color, going to my libraries, and go down to this plus sign, and I can add that fill color or graphic or whatever I want in here. Sometimes you may be working in a project and find out that you need to switch over to CMYK or from CMYK to RGB. To do that, you just go up to File, Document Color Mode, and you can change it over here. And the final thing I want to show you in this tutorial is how to import custom swatches using Adobe Color Themes, which is a very, very helpful tool when choosing colors for a project. So go to Windows, Color Themes, you can see we have different color themes. I previously searched 80s retro. Now you can do color themes by popularity if I just click explore. By just clicking explore, it opens up the most popular current ones. So here someone thinks these colors are associated with summer. Or you can search for different colors to fit your themes. So let's do sci-fi. It pops up different sci-fi sci colors. You can do uh, fantasy. gold or 80s retro you get a bunch of colors associated with those different things that you search so I like this color palette here and if I want to work with it I can import it into my color swatches by clicking here and putting add to swatches now if I exit out of here select one of these colors Go to my fill, you can see the swatches are added down here. So let's go ahead and change that color to this, uh, like that. And then we'll do this color followed by the pink. This kind of looks like those eight, those cups that every concession stand had, uh, or at least the color profile does. And again, those swatches are only in this illustrator file if i go into another illustrator file or open up a new one these color swatches won't be there well that's all i have for you in this tutorial why don't you go ahead and continue practicing changing the colors and manipulating the rgb values or the hsb values if you found this tutorial useful please drop us a like subscribe and ring that bell so you don't miss any future videos and i'll see you in the next video thanks for watching Welcome back guys to this Illustrator Basics tutorial. Today we're going to be going over gradients. You can see between this one that I've already worked on and this one how the gradient really makes it pop. It brings another bit of pizzazz compared to a flat background color. So open up the 12 gradients.ai file that you downloaded in the tutorial files. If you do not have it downloaded yet, you can find the link to it in the description to download those files. So you select the background and you have some options for the gradient. You could pick this black to white, this orange to red, and then this blue to clear. We're going to go with the black to white and then click down here in the gradient options. And that opens up this options panel. So we want to change these colors to be more of the colors that we're working with in this, this file. So we'll double click this to bring up the swatches panel and we'll choose that purple that we've been working with. And then we'll click here and then double click this to bring it up again. And we're going to choose a very light blue. So that's how we change colors. You can add more colors by clicking somewhere around the middle when that plus sign pops up. And the color that this takes on is whatever color is there in the center. If you wanna change it, you can double click it and change it as well. So we have now a purple to a red to a blue. To delete it, you just click and drag those away and it deletes those. We have different styles of gradients we can work with. We have the linear one, which is set now, radial gradient, and then a freeform gradient. With the linear gradient and the radial gradient, you get this tool that kind of pops up that you can manipulate both on here and you can also manipulate it here. So you can see we could change the subtlety or the aggress aggression of the gradient, make it a more aggressive change or making a more subtle change over time. And then you could come out here and you could change the way this gradient moves so that you can make it go more a diagonal than a straight on gradient. Alternately, you could pick the gradient tool and click that and freeform draw your gradient like that. With the radial gradient tool, you could click and change the size of the radial. 
you can pick it up and move it, move it around. So you could have the gradient over here if, in, if you want to have like something here that's overshadowing it. But let's go back to the linear gradient. Press Control Zero. You can even add gradients within an object that you made. Let's go ahead and select this object and go to Fill, add that gradient in there. And then we're going to double click in here and make that the blue. Then we'll double click here and make that the purple. And then we could change the aggression of that gradient so it's leaning more towards the purple with only a hint of blue. And we'll take our gradient tool and use that to change how the tool, how the gradient looks. So that's it. Gradients are pretty simple. If you like this video, please drop us a like and subscribe and ring that bell so you don't miss any future videos. I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching. Welcome back guys to this Illustrator Basics tutorial. Today we're going to be going over the basic text tool. So to get started, let's just make a interesting background. Go ahead and give this a color. Uh, let's give it a gradient like we did from our last tutorial. Go into the gradient options. We will click this one. Let's make it a deep purple. And then this one we will make a light blue or a dark blue. I like that. Get rid of that. And to bring up the text tool, you can either hit T or just go right over to the type tool and click it. If you click and hold it, you'll get more type tool options. You can even bring up a vertical type tool if you want to type text that's vertical like so. But we're right now just going to focus on the basic type tool. So if you just click once and release, you're going to bring up what's called a point type box. And this box is just going to start here where you click and it's going to go on forever. So no matter how much you type, it just keeps going and going and going. Go ahead and delete that. Now, if you bring up the type tool and you click and drag, you're going to open up what's called an area type box. So the text will only fill this area, no matter how big or small you make the text, it'll just fill this area at the most. So this is useful if you want to confine the text to a certain spot in the layout. It'll give it boundaries so that you won't have any text bleeding over where it's not supposed to be. Now, this text that you see here that's popped up is called Lorem Ipsum. It's a common filler text essentially to give you an idea of what text will look like in your layout. Uh, it's just basically random Latin and a lot of times we use it when we're mocking something up for a client instead of using the copy that the copywriter has written or coming up with our own copy. When we're just looking for layout guidance from the client we'll use lorem ipsum because they tend to want to give you grammatical changes even though if you're just saying, hey, I just want to know if this layout looks right, we'll work on, we're still working on the text. So you just throw in some Lorem Epsom and they're not, uh, they don't feel like they have to critique the grammar anymore. Anyways, the options you have for your, your type tool are over here under the properties panel. You could change the character, change whether it's regular or if there, if there are like italics or bold versions. You can change the size of the text. You can change the space between lines, the kerning, whatever, and you can even change the style of paragraphs and justification. Now when you change the, the font type, you can click this drop down and it gives you a lot of options here. You can just scroll through and find something you like, or if there's a specific style, you can go up here to the filters and really use these filters to narrow down whatever you might be looking for in a text. And if there isn't something that you like, you can go to Adobe's website which is fonts.adobe.com. And you can type in here what you're looking for or just browse the fonts. And when you browse the fonts, you have these same tags that you can use to help you narrow down what you're looking at. But once you find something, you can just click on it. So let's say I like this Candon font right here. You click it to open it up. You can type in your own sample text to see whether what you want to type looks good in this font. You can see the different styles of fonts available here. You can see the designer. And then up here, you can see the licensing that this font has. It's uh, full Adobe Fonts Library is cleared for both commercial and pro personal use, personal commercial use. So, you know, you can use this in your commercial work. But once you've found the font that you want to use, you can either click to activate them individually. So if you only want the bold, you can just do that. Or you can go up here and click activate six fonts. 
and that'll activate all those fonts within your Adobe program. Hop back over to Illustrator and we'll just click this and let's search for it. And you see it brings it right up immediately in Illustrator. Sometimes it doesn't show up here, so you might have to save, exit out, and restart the program to get, get it to import those fonts, but usually it makes it automatically uh, right here in Illustrator. Additionally, if you there are fonts that you like to use the most, you can favorite them and then have the fonts show as favorite right here, or show your favorite fonts right here. Well, that's all I really have on the type tool. If you found this tutorial useful, please like, subscribe, and ring that bell so that you don't miss any of our future videos. And I will see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching. Welcome back everyone to this Illustrator Basics tutorial. Today we're going to be going over the warp tool and all the other distor distortion related effects within Illustrator. So to start off, let's go ahead and create a nice background for things to show up against. Go with a nice gray, like so. You can go with whatever color you like. Then I'm going to click away so I don't have anything selected. Take out my rectangle tool again and choose a nice color. Let's go with red. And I'm just going to draw a square and then take my type tool and just do a simple type letter. Just write my name like so. Then I'll select it and increase the font size. There we go. Now to get to our warp tool, go ahead down here to this one. It's called the width tool. Click and hold, and then you should be able to see the warp tool right there. The warp tool works pretty simply. You just point it over whatever you want to warp. Let's go ahead and lock this background real quick. Control two locks the background because you actually don't have to have anything selected for the warp tool to manipulate it. See, I don't have anything selected, but I can warp the square. So you see, the warp tool basically just takes whatever you're that within that circle you're clicking on and allows you to pull it in different directions. And you just have to click and drag around to do that. You see I'm moving it down like that. And that's our end result. It's pretty simple when working with shapes. But if I go over here to this text, I can't do anything with it. That's because the warp tool or these distortion tools don't work with text. If you want to distort text, what you're going to have to do is get your selection tool and select it. And remember, make note of what font you're using. Because if you do something with the warp tool and you make something, then you end up having to change what the uh, letters are. You're going to have to remember what that font is. You may want to revisit that in the future. So once you have that selected, go up to type and go down to create outlines and you see it creates outlines of our letters so we can select that and it selects the whole thing we could use the direct selection tool to manipulate the individual anchor points of each letter so let's go ahead get our warp tool out now you can see the warp tool can now affect our letters so that's the warp tool basically just pulls part of the object in whatever direction you want to go to. So next, let's go ahead and go down to the twirl tool. So all it does is take whatever you're, you're pointed at within that circle and twirls it in a circle. Now it won't do anything within here because it's all red. No matter how much it twirls, it's just gonna be red. But if I would do it towards the edge, you can see it grabs that area and twirls it around. Like so. And the next one is the pucker tool. And the pucker tool just takes those paths and pulls them in towards the center of the circle. If I make like a bigger area of type, it actually helps see it better. And we'll just take and oh, go. We'll just take and turn that into outlines. And we'll take our pucker tool. You can see it pulls it in closer like that. The next tool is our bloat tool, and it's the exact opposite of the pucker tool it pushes things away from the center 
So if I'm on this side of it, it's pushing that in, but if I'm here, it pushes it out. Next tool, the scallop tool, kind of creates like a scalloped edge towards it. It's like the pucker tool, but it's, it's scalloping the edges instead of just making them straight pull in. Next tool, the crystallized tool. It's the opposite of the scallop tool. So it's like the bloat tool, but with the scallops, scalloped edges. And then our final tool is the wrinkle tool. This one just kind of wrinkles it a little bit, makes it look like you got water on it or it's melting or whatever. Now these tools, some of them have options. When you double click them, they'll bring up the options. You can change the dimensions of the brush, the width of the, the wrinkle options. So this one's set to just doing vertical wrinkles. You saw when I was working with the edge, it wasn't doing anything here, but it will do it on the vertical side. But if I would change it, I could change the vertical or the horizontal to 100 and the vertical to zero and now it wrinkles horizontal, but it doesn't wrinkle vertical. In the twirl tool, similar options. You could change the angle of it and everything, the intensity of the twirl, the twirl rate. Well, that's all I have for you for this tutorial. Why don't you keep practicing with these tools? If you found this tutorial useful, click that like button, subscribe, and ring that bell so you don't miss any future videos. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching. Hello and welcome back to this Illustrator Basics tutorial. Today we're going to be going over warp effects. So go ahead and open up that 15 warp effects.ai file. You'll see we have several separate colored bars and that's just so we can see how the warp effect goes across the whole object. So go ahead and select them all and go up to effect, warp and arc and you'll bring up your warp options panel you can see that this the way this works was it it kind of treats each bar as an independent thing and it's not working with them together as a group like you may have wanted so to do that let's go ahead and hit cancel we'll hit Control g to group these items together and then we'll select it go to effect warp arc and you can see it smooths out those edges and treats these as one object instead of five different ones. We could change how the, oops, the arc works. We could arc it on the vertical instead of a horizontal axis. You can also change the way this is distorted so you can affect the horizontal so it's more arcs more one way than the other. Change that back to zero. Or you could change it vertical so it kind of leans back or forward at you. There are, are also several styles of arcs that you can go through. I'm just going to cycle through each one of these real quick. And something important to remember as, as I cycle through these, you can change these, these options here under the warp options, and those will stay persistent across all of these at once. So no matter where you go, so if you change the bend to 60%, it'll be 60% across all of these styles. Okay, so let's go back to arc and hit okay to keep that. Okay, so now let's say you love this arc. It's your favorite thing in the world, but you want it to be sideways. So what are we, what are you gonna do? Well, you, you would think you would just hold here and rotate, but you see it kind of messes with the way this illustrator draws warping arcs like this. So you may think, oh, I'm out of luck. I'm gonna have to go back and then rotate it and then all this jazz. But if you're happy with this and you want to lock this in, you can just go up to Object, Expand Appearance, and then this will enable you to now rotate that object freely. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. It's really a really simple lesson today. The, the warp tool, there's really not much to it. Go ahead and play around with that for a little while. And if you found this tutorial useful, please drop us a like, subscribe, and ring that bell so you don't miss any future videos. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching. Welcome back to this Illustrator Basics tutorial. Today we're going to go over vectorizing an image. So you might want to vectorize an image if you want to take like a still frame from your video or maybe a promotional shot and you want to make it into some promotional artwork or a thumbnail for your video. But you want, don't want it to just be a bland picture. You want to add some, some artistic flair to it. 
you can vectorize that image to make it look hand-drawn or watercolor or just different than a standard photo. So let's go ahead and import our file photo that we're going to work with. Go to File, Place, and choose 16 free stocks on splash.jpg. I'm going to click and drag this in. Okay. Now go ahead and with your selection tool, make sure that you have the photo selected and it opens some options down here, but we're going to focus on image trace. So click that and it drops down some options. I'm going to go ahead and select six colors. Okay. Now this process could take a while depending on the, your machine. If you have an older laptop or an older machine, this could take up to several minutes. I've got a pretty beefy machine, so you can see it only took a few seconds. But here we have a six color version of our photo. It kind of looks like a watercolor almost, minus the brush strokes. Now we can go into some more options by going over here and clicking on the live trace panel, which opens that up. There's some more presets along the top, so we could click high color preset, or we could go to high fidelity or low fidelity or black and white logo, shades of gray. For our final one that I'll show you will be 16 colors. Now there's some other options there. Uh, they don't really work the best with this specific photo, so I'm not gonna bother showing them, but you guys can play around with them if you like. So now we have some options here. We can view the tracing results and turn that on or click this to see the original source image. We could view trace results with outlines, just the outlines, source image, trace results, or just click this eye to click and hold the eye to quickly look at it. We could change the mode we're in. We could do color, grayscale, black and white. The palette, we can change the palette where it's limited or automatic, or we can increase the number of colors that we are sampling here. So let's go ahead and increase that to 20. You see it resamples this image and kind of brings some more colors back into it. Now once you have your your image live traced, the problem with this is if if you have more work to do with this image, it's got to recalculate it every time you you do anything to it. So if I resize it here, you see it has to recalculate everything all over again. And that's because it's live tracing the image constantly. Let's go ahead and make that full size again there. So if you know this is the image you want to lock down, you're going to work with this image. There's no more changes that you're going to do within the live trace or the image trace options. Make sure you have it selected and go over to here and click expand. And that transforms it into just a bunch of paths and we no longer have the ability to change any of the options, so I'll click out. But you can direct select things with the direct select tool. You can move that away, move this portion of our jacket away. If you wanna change specific colors in here, so maybe you wanna change this gray tone, go up to select same fill color, and it'll select that fill color, and we can change it to like a green. You can see it changes that fill, every instance of that fill color to a green. I use that more on large art projects that I'm doing, where halfway through I've decided that I don't like a specific color, but I've used that color a ton. So if I want to change it, I can just go that select same fill of color and it'll select it all and then I can change it easily. Well, that's all we have for vectorizing an image. It's a real short lesson today. So if you found this video helpful, please drop us a like, subscribe, and ring that bell so you don't miss any future videos. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. Hello and welcome to this Illustrator Basics tutorial. Today we're going to be going over exporting. So go ahead and open up that 17exporting.ai file located in the course files that you downloaded. If you have not downloaded them yet, you can find a link to them in the description. Now, a common problem or a common complaint I've seen from people is that when they export a picture or a file, the quality is really low compared to what they see with an illustrator. So there's likely one reason for that. So you go to effect, document raster, effect settings, 
And you'll see here I have the resolution set to high 300 ppi. Now sometimes it gets set to screen 72 or medium 150 and that's what will give you those lower quality exports. If for some reason you're not having a transparent background, make sure you check here and ensure that it's set to transparent and not white. Because if you have white selected and you don't have anything in a particular area of the background, it'll just come out as white. All right, first I'm gonna show you how we export things as PDFs. You'll commonly use a PDF uh, when you're sending things off to like a printer or a merchandising company, or when you're just sending it off for someone to take a look at. If you, you've got graphics that you want them to look at, you may send them off as a PDF because it's a generally small file size and you can send them through email back and forth several times without the file getting too big and or having to upload it to a drive like Google Drive. So go up here to File and just go down to Save As. And when the Save As menu comes up, go ahead and click the Class Files button so that we're in the Class Files folder. Lower the drop down, you'll see right here the option to save as an Adobe PDF is here. So go ahead and click that. I'm going to name it as Exporting PDF 1. And click Save. And you'll get this dialog box that opens up. And we have one option here that we're typically going to uncheck. I would go ahead and uncheck this preserve illustrator editing capabilities. I'm going to leave it checked for this so I can show you the difference. Very little difference in the actual file, but the difference comes in the file size. So I'm going to go ahead and click save PDF, file, save as, exporting PDF 2, save it as an Adobe PDF, save, and I'm going to unclick that and save the PDF. And you'll get this warning. I'm going to click OK. And if you look here, you can see that the file size between the PDF 2 and PDF 1 is huge. You can get this tiny little file for only 45 kilobytes or for 316 kilobytes if you preserve that ability to edit it in Adobe Illustrator. Since you have the actual Adobe Illustrator file here, you're unlikely to need it need a, a PDF that you can edit. So just go ahead and save them without the ability to edit them in Adobe Illustrator. So if you're exporting these as a JPEG or PNG or SVG file, just go to File, Export, Export As, and then down here in the Dropbox, you can, you can change it from PNG, JPEG, SVG, TIFF if you need it. So let's go ahead and select that PNG and we'll just be exporting exporting PNG and we will click export and here you can see what the export will look like as a small preview of it We've got that transparency background up here you can set the resolution again you may have to change it to high if you want to keep it with a high quality and hit OK and again you can use that exact method to render out JPEGs PNGs or SVG files Alternatively, you can export multiple versions of this file. If you go to File, Export, Export for Screens, and you'll get this dialog box that opens up. Down here, we have one version of this artboard set, scale of one, and it's set for a PNG. So we're just gonna click Add Scale. We're gonna change the scale back to one, but we're going to export a JPEG, and you can change the suffix on this if you wanted to, so that you know, if, if say I wanted several JPEG, there's several PNGs, but with one scaled in. So this PNG will have a suffix of at two times. If I'm rendering out versions of a graphic that all are under like one heading, say it's for like scene one of a video I'm working on, I can go down here and add a prefix. It says scene, scene one, and then It'll have the name up here of the artboard that I name it, so I can name this as Icons. So now all of these will render out with the prefix Scene1, Icons, and then the normal PNG won't have any suffix. The JPEG 100 will have a 100 suffix, and the PNG that's scaled up two times will have an at two times suffix. We make sure we have the folder here. This is going to our class files folder. If we wanted to drop it into his own subfolder, we can click right here with create subfolder. And then to export, we just click export artboard. 
here you can see that we have the exporting PNG that we did earlier, scene one icons, scene one icons at two times, and scene one icons 100 JPEG. Now there's one more way you can export things. So we have a bunch of icons here. What if you wanted to export just these icons individually? Well, you go to window, and then you go down to asset export. And this brings up this panel. And you can add whatever you want to export to it by just clicking, oh, I want to have the selection tool, clicking and dragging it over to the assets panel and it drops it in there. You can change the name of the asset by click, double clicking there and typing in what you want, cloud. And then down here, it'll show you how many versions of these assets it's going to make. So if I want a JPEG or a PDF of that one, and then I also want a JPEG of it. That way I have all my bases covered and it'll add in the suffixes there. I want to have a suffix of PDF behind the PDF one. That way I can just see it in the name. And in the export, you would just click export. But we can do, do more than just this one asset. We could do all of these assets. So let's highlight that one and we will drag it over. So let's highlight the crown and we'll drag it over and drop it in place. And you see, see our crown was in there as well and it'll export three versions that we've set up down here. So let's go ahead and rename that to crown. Okay, next we will get the yin yang we have here and we'll click and drag it over here. Oh, what happened here? We have two different parts of the yin yang showing up as different things. Well, these, they're not grouped together. So when we go to put them in the asset exporter, Illustrator thinks we want them to export individually. So to make sure we get them to export properly we're going to hit control 2 to group them together and then bring them in yin yang and so we make sure those are grouped control 2 and control 2 so now that we know that the asset exporter will automatically group together things that are grouped and separate the things that aren't grouped we can go ahead and highlight both of these icons and bring them over into the asset exporter at once We'll type mask, camera, when we're ready to export, we'll click this first one, go down to our last icon, hold down shift, and click it so it highlights all of them. Then we'll just go down to export, it'll pop up this dialog window with the save stuff. Inside our class files folder, I made an icons folder, so I'm going to save them all within there. And now it's going to export each one individually. In here, you can see we have our camera PNG, camera JPEG, camera PDF, and the same one for each one of those icons, all quickly exported through the asset export. If you're using a lot of your graphics in videos that you're making, you should be exporting them as just straight Illustrator files. You can import Illustrator files into Premiere and After Effects. And if you do that, your images and graphics are gonna retain more clarity, more crispness, and you're not going to lose any detail because it's gonna be stored in that vector format. So you can save versions of your file by going to file, save, or save as, or even save a copy. Well, that's all I have for today. If you found this tutorial helpful, drop us a like, subscribe, and ring that bell so you don't miss any future videos. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching. Welcome back to the final episode in this Illustrator Basics tutorial series. Today we're going to talk about hotkeys, the alignment tool, and creating your own workspace, along with a few resources that are useful for Illustrator. So first let's talk about hotkeys. I have a printable version inside the Illustrator tutorial file that you downloaded. It's labeled 18 hotkeys and I have a PDF and PNG of it. So you can print that out and hang it up somewhere nearby so you have a reference for all the default hotkeys listed here. Now these are only a few of the hotkeys, but they're ones that you will probably be using a lot starting out. As you get more in depth, you may find that you need other hotkeys or that you need to assign hotkeys that quite don't exist. So to do that, you can go to edit keyboard shortcuts and then this opens up a dialog panel that, that enables you to scroll down and you can see all the tools. Some of them aren't assigned anything and you can assign a hotkey to it. 
You can open it up to different things, like there's the file commands. You can look at the window commands, so you could set a hotkey to open up specific windows. Or you can go up here and search. So if you want to look for your export options, just type export in. Don't hit enter because it'll be like if you're hitting OK. And then you'll see all your different options that you have for exporting. Right now we only have hotkeys for export for screens, but we could set one for export as. So let's say we want to set this hotkey. All we have to do is type in the keys that we want it to be. So let's do Alt Control E. Now down here, we have a dialog that pops up to warn us that there's a conflict between the one that we chose for the export as and a previous one. So we can go to the conflict if it wasn't already here, or we can undo it and try something different. I'm going to go ahead and undo in order to reset my export for screens as Alt Control E. Now, if you make changes to your keyboard shortcuts, you can save them by going here and pressing OK, or you can save a whole new key set file by going up here and clicking this button and renaming it. So if you wanted to have several different file versions, you can do that. Now hit OK, hit Yes. Go ahead and open up 18align.ai and 18align2.ai. So the Align tool is great. It helps you get even spacing and really polishing some of your work. So to use it, all you have to do is click and drag over a bunch of different objects and you'll see the Align tool open up in the Properties panel. To get more options, you can click this and it'll open up more options for the Align tool. But I don't want to have to keep clicking that, so I'm just going to go to Window and bring in the Align tool, a separate Align tool window. Just like that. Now down here in the bottom right, you can drop that down and it'll bring you some options for how you're going to align. You can align off your entire selection, so it'll take the selection and align to it. Or you can align off the artboard or align to a key object. To set a key object, all you have to do is select a bunch of objects and then click the one you want to be key. And then it'll put a thicker blue outline around it. So right now that's our key object but we're gonna work with align to selection for the minute. That should be your default one. So when you look at these align options, you'll notice that there's a line and some boxes. That line will be the base that everything aligns to or aligns off of when you click it. So here, this will align everything in the middle. So everything will align in the middle of the object. So if we had some elongated objects or some short objects and we selected them all, then we it would align in the middle of those objects. We can align off the top or off the bottom. And then down here, we can change the distribute spacing. So we can distribute spacing left and right. And since we have align selection selected, it distributes it based off the selection we have here. So if we wanted to move these objects in a little bit more and select them, and realign left to right, it'll distribute between the left and right object with, that we have selected. If we move this one out further and redo it, it again moves the distribution. Now what would happen if we align to the left and we have all of our objects in a horizontal line? Well, they all line up on top of each other. But now since the all the objects are right on top of each other, when you distribute the spacing left and right, it's not going to move because you don't have a right limit. So we could select all of them, change just the artboard, and then hit that distribute spacing. And now it distributes between the left and right limit of the artboard. If we selected a key object, so we select that middle one, and we want to distribute left and right of zero, it'll align them up so that they're all touching from left and right. And then we can just increase the space there a little bit or decrease it and it moves it so that this is still in the center and everything aligns off of it. Now everything we talked about horizontally also applies vertically. So feel free to pause this video or come back to these selections and just practice with the align tool. It does take some getting used to. I know when I first started out, I used to end up like this a lot with all of my objects stacked up on top of each other. So just take your time practicing that and get it, getting it right. And remember, Control-Z is your friend when it comes to the Align tool. While I have this Align panel out, let's talk about creating your own workspace. Right now, we're using the Essentials workspace. 
which sets everything up like so. You can change the Essentials Workplace by adding new windows and putting them wherever you want, or you can create your own by going to Windows, Workspace, New Workspace, and you can write a name. So I'm gonna put Tutorial Workspace, hit Enter, and that puts us in here. So if I wanted to add more windows to this panel, like say I wanted the Align panel out here permanently, all I have to do is click and drag it, and you'll see these blue areas starting to highlight, and that'll show you where this goes. So right now, if I released it, the Align tool would just become one of the tabs in this panel. If I pull it away, it'll become its own panel here in its own window. If I bring it back in and I go above them, then that will add that panel above this tabbed panel here. And I can always reference the Align panel. You can bring in the swatches. If you always wanted to have your swatch panel open. You could even move panels around that are in here. So if you wanted your tool panel to sit on the right side with everything over here, you could do that. If you've made a monstrosity of a, of a workspace, you can always go to Window, Workspace, Reset Tutorial Workspace, which would reset it back to where it was when I first created this. Or if you wanted to just get rid of it completely, change your workspace to something different like Essentials, and then go down to Manage Workspaces, select it, and click the Delete key. You could also rename it or add more workspaces in here. Finally, before I go, I wanted to show you guys a couple resources that I use regularly when creating graphics. So here we have uigradients.com. When you first go here, it'll take you to a random gradient, but you could click here to see all the gradients that they have. You could narrow it down by color. So if you wanted to look at pink gradients, go back to showing all gradients again. And when it gives you a gradient, you can click it. And if you find a gradient that you like, so if I click big head, it'll show you the hex value of the left and right colors used to make this gradient. Another option is gradient.com. This one I like a little bit better than UI gradients, although UI gradients has better search, search functionality. This one, you can scroll down through and see a bunch of different ones. And all you have to do is hover over one of the color swatches and it'll give you the hex value. You can add colors to a gradient. So if I wanted to add white up here, or let's add red. So it goes from that pastel purple and blue to a deep red. And then you can even edit the subtlety and aggression of the gradients. To get the hex value, you can right click on these colors and it'll give you the hex value or you and a slider that you can use to adjust it. So if I wanted to make a pastel green to this, this way a little more, right about there. And then I'll give you the hex value for that and you can copy and paste it or the RGB value. So this, these websites really come in handy when you're making gradients or backgrounds for your, your graphics. And sometimes I don't even use the colors I see here. I just get an idea of something that I'd like to see in my project by just scamming through here. Well, that's all I have for you in this episode. And that's all I have for you in this basic tutorial series. If you found this tutorial series helpful, please drop this video a like, subscribe and ring that bell so you don't miss any future videos. And I will see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching.